Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Hey, you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord today? Amen. Now listen, you didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. It's not about that. Not about us coming hearing from the ideas and the philosophies or the pontification of a man. Listen, that's not what this is about. It's about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So would you, if you have the ability, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this church service. God, how awesome it is to see people's lives touched. God, and volumes could be written about what you've done here today. Lord, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further. We want to go farther with you, deeper with you, Lord Jesus. We pray that as you open up your word to us, God, that you open us up to receive it. It was eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the motivation, even the instruction and the correction that we need for our lives, Lord. May it produce something in every one of us, Lord. How awesome you are that you can speak a now word to every person in this place, God. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we need to ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. No time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom, God. So bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel this day. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest. Thank you for Oak Valley and the Well and the Way. Thank you for Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, for the Foursquare denomination and the Assemblies of God. Lord, all those that are naming Jesus as Lord, we bless them this day as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat and get your Bible out and go with me to the wonderful book of Hebrews. For those of you that are joining us today, and there's a lot of you guys today, I'm excited about that, but let me explain something to you. We at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, no matter who's in the pulpit, on Sunday mornings we've been going line upon line, precept upon precept. You say, what's that mean, Pastor? Well, here's what it means. It means that when this text was written, there wasn't chapter and verse. And there was just continuous thoughts that we have from the Word of God. And so if God wrote it that way, we ought to be able to understand it that way. And so we don't skip around. We don't do topical sermons and things like that. We go line upon line, precept upon precept. And as we go, it forces us to see what God is saying, to get a continuous thought, and to pull out things that maybe we wouldn't normally go to. But God brings out these amazing revelations and opens up his word to us in a fresh, new way. Today we're in Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse number five. And we're going to read through verse number six. Now, you will notice in verse number five that we're starting in the middle of a sentence. And that's okay, all right, because we're, we're in context. We're describing what it is, where we come from, talking about the earthly temple. There are earthly priests who are doing something. And so we're going to kind of pick up in the middle of a sentence. But really, the emphasis of where we're going is the next sentence into the next verse. Okay, so let's read about it together. If you remember, we talked about already in Hebrews, the eighth chapter, we talked about having a better 2014. Pastor Jim brought a great message about living better in 2014. Then last time we were together in the book of Hebrews, Pastor Luke brought a wonderful word of God about fulfilling the plan of God for our lives. Today, he was the eighth chapter. We're talking about the pattern of life. Title of today's message is the pattern of life. And you'll see this as we go through the word of the Lord today and we pull out some thoughts for our lives. Hebrews the 8th chapter, verse number 5 says this, speaking of the priest, it says, who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle was a tent in the wilderness that the children of Israel brought with them that housed the presence of God. It was a place where they would make the sacrifices and then they would bring the blood in before the presence of God and they would make atonement or a covering for the sin of the nation. So these priests that were here on earth served the copy and the shadow. It wasn't the substance wasn't the reality. This was something that was a picture of something that was to come, speaking of Jesus. Now, the next sentence comes along and says, For he said, capital H, speaking of God, speaking to Moses, he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. There was a time when Moses went up Mount Sinai. 
There he was in the presence of God 40 days and 40 nights without food or water. He was maintained by the presence of God. His life was sustained by that. You cannot survive that long without water. You can without food, but not without water. Therefore, something supernatural took place. A miracle took place. And God's presence sustained Moses while God spoke to him and delivered the law to him. Now, God started to speak to Moses and said, I want you to build a tabernacle, build this tent, and I want you to see to it that you keep the pattern according and shown to you on the mountain. So Moses had strict instructions from the Lord. I don't want you to deviate. I don't want you to put your own little artistic twist on this, Moses. I want it to be done exactly like I showed you. Why is that so important? Because when he comes down from the mountain, he's delivering to the children of Israel a picture of a heavenly reality. See, this was to be matching the heavenly tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this world. And it was also a picture of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus told the religious leaders of his day that they searched the scriptures that speak of him. And so this is really a picture of Jesus Christ. So if they didn't make the picture correctly, they would get the wrong image of who Jesus was. That's why it was so important. The next verse comes along and says this, but now he, speaking of Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Now we'll come back to those thoughts, but I want to point out something to you. That when Moses was delivered on the mountain was to be carried out down there with the people in the valley and in the plain. And we, as we come to church, we climb up to the heights with God. What do I mean by that? I mean that there is something that lifts us when we come into church. When you come into the presence of God, God takes you higher. God takes you up. God brings you up the mountain. And that mountain is Jesus Christ. Think about it this way. If you've ever climbed a mountain or, or, or been on top of a mountain, you know that that is a meeting of heaven and earth. There you are and the sky is right there. I mean, uh, there have been times where I've been hiking and I've looked down and seen a helicopter, you know. You're up high. You're, you're very, very lofty at that point. And now all of a sudden, heaven meets earth and you're in a new place. And there you can see there's great things going on. It's a rush. My goodness. In the same way, when we come to church, we are climbing that mountain, and that mountain is that place where heaven meets earth. Jesus is that mountain. He is the meeting of divinity and humanity all in one. And when we climb that mountain, when we go up and, and look at Jesus, God shows to us a pattern for life that is meant to be lived in the valley and in the plain. Have you ever left church? As you get into your car, man, in church, you were, you were happy. You were excited. You, you, were, you were jumping up and down, spitting and screaming, hollering, you know, just having a good time, laughing. Then you get out in your car and you start your car, and it's almost as if the problem was sitting in the back seat staring at you in your rearview mirror. Anybody happen to that happened to them other than Pastor Dan? Okay, see, I'm not alone in this place. See, but what God has shown you on the mountain is to be lived out in the valley. You may leave this place today and your problem, your trial, your pressure is still there staring at you. And yet God says, I've shown you the pattern. I've shown you how to deal with this. Carry out what you have seen on the mountain in the valley. What about the plain? Sometimes in our lives and in our walk with the Lord, we may feel like we're going up, 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 up. And then all of a sudden we, we start to plateau. We start to kind of coast. You know, there's nothing wrong. Nothing's bad. But is anything really good? You know, and you're, you're just kind of there. Everything's copacetic, you know. It's just kind of lethargic. It's just kind of frozen. And, and, and you're wondering what's going on. See, God says, I've got something for you there too. Your experiences in church are meant to be mountaintop experience. What you receive on the mountain is to be carried out in the valley and in the plain. You are to pattern your life after what you've seen there with God. When you leave this place, that's when the real work begins. That's when it's your job to pattern your life after what you see. God has an image in his heart for your life. God has already thought about your future. Think about it this way. This is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is the one who made the planets and who, who spun the stars and, and, and the solar systems and the galaxies and the universe all stretched out before him. This is the God who measured out the waters of the earth in his hand. 
This is the God who knows how much dust and, and can count the numbers of sand on the seashore, not just our seashore, but every seashore worldwide. This is the God who knows the number of hairs on your head and formed you in your mother's womb. See, God is not only a God of the macro, but God is also a God of the micro. God knows how your body works and how your systems all react with one another. God knows how gravity works and how light and heat and all that kind of stuff works. But think about it this way. God knew about all that stuff before he created it. Because in order to create it, he had to know how it was going to work to create it the right way. So God already had to know how the draw of the sun was going to pull the earth at its right axis and how it was going to spin and rotate around and how there was going to be times and seasons and heat and cold. God had to know about all that stuff before he created it. And then he spoke it into existence, carried it out and created it. In the same way, God has a plan for your life. God has an idea. He has an image in his mind of your life, of your outcomes. And therefore, when we go before God and when we get into the word of God and we climb that mountain, now all of a sudden we get the image that the Father has on his heart for our lives. And then we are to carry that image out. But let's speak in terms that we can understand uh, any builder of houses. Would they just go and start cutting wood and start putting things up to start building a home? No. What are they going to have? They're going to have a plan first, right? They'll have a blueprint. Some architect, before anything was ever cut, before any nail was ever hammered, before any wire was ever cut, before any foundation was ever poured, what happened? Somebody had a picture in their mind of what a house should look like, and then they planned it out, they wrote it all out, they, they made measurements and designs and all that kind of stuff, and they made a blueprint, and then from that blueprint, now all of a sudden the plan is carried out. In the same way God has plans for our life. Let me show it to you in the Word. Let me show it to you in the Word. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, in the New International Version. I chose this version because I like the way that it said it for what we're talking about today. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, in the New International Version. If you don't have that version, don't worry about it. I'll put it up on the overheads for you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, in the New International Version says this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Everybody say the plans. Amen. See, we're talking about God has an image in his mind of your life. And God says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Look at his plans. He starts to tell us what his plan is. Thank God he does because we could get discouraged and think, oh, I'm never going to know it. I'll just have to figure it out. Maybe I'll trip over it someday and find out what God has for me. And yet God says, no, I know the plans. Here's the plans. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Anybody that says God wants us broke down, busted, disgusted, sick, weak Christians has not read their Bible. Because God says, I know the plan, and the plan is to prosper you and not to harm you. God is not waiting around the corner with a two-by-four for you to come around so he can whack you in the face. That's not my God. My God says, I want to prosper you. I want your life blessed. I want you to succeed. I want you to have a healthy family. I want you to have children serving the Lord. I want you to have a great marriage. I want you to have a great business. <laughs> Plans to give you a hope and a future. God doesn't want us depressed, in despair, worried, doubt, fear, unbelief. No, God wants to give us a hope. Hope is the blueprint for our future. That our faith goes to work on and brings about in our life. As we climb this mountain, we see the plan of God. And we carry it out as we pattern our lives after it. There was a teacher who taught the slaves who were freed from the Civil War. And they wrote of a woman who, after she had learned her alphabet, said something very interesting. Listen to this. She says, now I want to learn to spell Jesus. For it appears like the rest will come easier if I learn to spell the blessed name first. Isn't that awesome? Let me read that again to you. A woman who is just freed from slavery, now is being educated, being taught. She learns her alphabet and she says, now I want to learn to spell Jesus. For it appears like the rest will come easier if I learn to spell the blessed name first. Jesus is the pattern we follow. He was not cut from the cloth of this earth. No, he was broken from the side of God himself. Just like the mountain is the meeting of heaven and earth, Christ, Christ is the meeting of humanity and divinity. And when we pattern our lives after his, when we learn to spell his name first, a great many things come easier in our life. So, patterns for life. Today, I want to give you a couple of things that as we pattern our life after Jesus, it changes the world that we live in. 
And as we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was the ultimate man. Think about it. This is the God man. God himself coming down, robed in flesh. If we should be looking to anybody for a pattern, it would be Jesus. And so overwhelmingly in the Bible, there are some things that we find. And we could have gone to tons of things. There could have been things that we could have talked about Jesus' life, like his doctrine, his teaching. We could have talked about, you know, his compassion and his care. We could have talked about his healing and his miracles. We could have talked about a lot of stuff. But overwhelmingly, there are a couple of things that we see in the life of Jesus that we can pattern our life after. A couple of them for us today. First one, patterns for life. First one is this. This one is the best. This one is the most important. This one is the most prevalent. And that is love. Patterns for life, first thing, right off the bat, you're going to see when you encounter Jesus, when you encounter the presence of God, when you look at Jesus, you're going to see love. In fact, most of the things that Jesus did, if you trace them back, you will find that the motivation that Jesus did that was love. Yes, he raised the dead. Yes, he did miracles. Why? Because he loved them. Yes, he preached and teached. And yes, he, he, he had encounters with people. Why? Because he loved them. Yes, he had compassion and, and, and cried tears over, over Jerusalem. And why? Because he loved them. See, Jesus was moved with love. In fact, he couldn't do anything else. Why? Because he is God in the flesh. And the Bible tells us that God is love. And therefore, Jesus' life is a life of love. You and I as Christians now have the life of God living on the inside of us. When you gave your heart and life to Jesus, maybe you didn't know this, but now you are now wall to wall, a Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit took residence inside of your heart, and therefore you've got God on the inside of you. And if you've got God on the inside of you, then love is on the inside of you, and you have the supreme power of the universe at work on the inside of you because God Almighty, the God of love, is now on the inside of you, and you can be motivated and flow in that love. Wow, isn't that amazing? You know, we re read in Hebrews chapter, verse, chapter 8, verse number 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. And he is also the mediator of a better covenant, established on better promises. See, all of this is better. Why? Because it's no longer of legality. This is no longer thou shalt love, thou shalt do, thou shalt not. It's no longer about that. It's no longer about legality or law. It's now about love. Our motivation is no longer the law and fearful expectation of judgment. No, now our motivation is I love God, therefore I won't steal. I love God, therefore I won't commit adultery. I love God, therefore I won't put any idols before him. I love God, therefore I shall have no other gods and serve them. See, that's our motivation is love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. And a more excellent ministry comes from a more excellent way. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13th chapter, that I will show you a more excellent way. And he wrote of the way of love. Jesus comes along in John the 13th chapter. Turn there with me. John the 13th chapter. Jesus has just come and they've had their Passover supper in the upper room. Now here he is speaking to his disciples. And Jesus does something very interesting. He does something that a Jewish rabbi would never do. See, the rabbi was the teacher. He was the one that everybody else served. And yet Jesus takes off his robe. He wraps himself in a towel. Gets a basin of water and he goes and he starts washing the disciples' feet. Now I don't know if you realize the magnitude of what Jesus is doing. Because I have a hard enough time thinking about washing some of the feet in this room. You know, you may have to deal with some sock funk, some toe jam, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And so I would have a difficult time doing that. But Jesus wasn't dealing with people who wore socks and shoes and rode around in cars and, and on bicycles and that sort of a thing. Jesus was dealing with people who walked everywhere they went. And there wasn't roads like there are today. They were walking down dusty dirt roads, muddy paths. They were walking through animal stuff. You know what I mean when I say stuff? Okay, are we all on the same page? They were walking in those places. So now Jesus kneels down and he starts to wash these dirty, nasty, calloused feet. And not only that, he wipes their feet dry with the towel that he's wearing. You know what that means? That means he took their filth on himself. Wow. He even knelt down and washed the feet of the one who would betray him that night. That's love. That's real love. That was his motivation. 
Now Jesus comes and he speaks to his disciples after giving them this beautiful image. And look at what he says in the book of John, the 13th chapter. John, the 13th chapter. We're going to take a look at verse number 34 and verse number 35. John, the 13th chapter, starting in verse number 34, says this. It says, a new commandment. See, there was some old commandments. There was an old law, but now here's the new co covenant, the new commandment. Look at what he says. The new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Look at verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I've seen people on the side of the road shouting angry, nasty words at the world. I've seen people on soapboxes on the corner condemning people. And yet Jesus said, that's not going to show the world who you are as my disciples. What's going to show the world who you are as my disciples is if you have love for one another. I should have highlighted that word love there. Love for one another. Why? Because when people see that love, they look past the person, past the outside, and they see to the source, they see to the motivation, and that is to the heart of God himself. Churches, we're moved by the love of God. It's going to change our families. It's going to change our marriage. It's going to change our children. It's going to change our, our business. It's going to change the workplace. It's going to change our community. It's going to change the world that we live in because love is the supreme power of the universe. <laughs> Talking about patterns for life. Patterns for life. The first one is love. Second one for today. Second pattern that we see in the word of God is we see Jesus. What do we see in the life of Jesus? Second pattern for life is this. Suffering. Now, if it wasn't quiet before, it sure is right now. Can, can I say something to you? No one likes this one. I don't like this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Had to cough in your ear for a second. Sorry about that. But nobody likes this. I do not want to suffer in my life. And yet, when I look at the life of Jesus, overwhelmingly, I see that he was a man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief. We often encounter sorrows, and I, I know I'm guilty of doing this, and we act as if something strange were happening, as if it's a foreign thing. What's going on, God? Why, Lord? And yet God says, what do you mean, why? That's the life that we live. That's the pattern shown to you on the mountain. That's what Jesus went through. And the Bible says that I do not compare the present sufferings that we're going through to, with the glory that is to be revealed in us. See, this is not the end. This is a temporary, just passing through. Adios, amigos, I'll see you later. Experience on the earth. And therefore, it doesn't matter what comes against us, what comes into our life, the sufferings. We can rejoice, we can smile, we can lift up our heads because we know that Jesus went through the same suffering. Like what Thomas Akempis said, he was a Catholic monk, very wise man, had a lot of wise things to say, and this quote really hit my heart. He said, Christ was willing to suffer and be, de be despised. And darest thou complain of anything? Wow. Think about that for a moment. We, we have a hard time when we didn't get our drink order right at Starbucks. <laughs> Why can't they just get it right? Never going there again. And yet Christ went to the cross, suffered, died. Listen, there's nobody banging down our doors, pointing guns at our heads, and saying, renounce your Lord or you die. We don't live that life. And yet, the sufferings that do come in our life, sometimes people don't understand us. Sometimes people will hate us, will be hated for the sake of the king. And the sufferings that we do get to encounter and experience, we should be rejoicing that we get to share in Christ's sufferings. Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. Hold your, hold your finger there in John or put a pencil or a ribbon or something there so you can get back to there. But after the book of Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. Right after the book of James, you'll find the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we're going to go to chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. It's talking about the same subject, suffering, and even suffering for doing what's good and right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. Look at this. 1 Peter 2, 21 says this. It says, for to this you were called. Everybody say, I was called. I was called. Now, most of the time when we talk about a calling, we think, you know, I'm called to preach. I'm called to minister. I'm called to serve. I'm called to love. I'm, I'm called to go out and tell somebody about Jesus. But there's another calling that we have in the word. Look at it with me. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow 
his steps. See, we're to follow the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Can I say this to you? We don't understand what that means. We think about taking up our cross and we think about wearing some jewelry, right? It's something pretty to put around our neck. So we take up our cross and we follow Jesus to church. And yet Jesus said, that's not what I'm talking about. If you lived in the days of the Roman era, you would know that taking up your cross meant you were getting beat, you were getting scorned, and that was a road that led to death. Therefore, we say, oh, man, is that what you're talking about, Jesus? I didn't know that's what you were talking about. And yet, remember that Jesus said that if you are died with him, you shall also be raised up again with him. And if you shared in his sufferings, you will also share in his glory. Now, that word example leaving us an example. You see that word up there on the overheads? That word example is a beautiful word picture in the original language. It speaks of a teacher who has the early level student that's learning how to write. So the teacher goes and sits down and they start to write letters out. And they write them very dark. And they write all these letters down and then they put that paper in front of their student. And they take another piece of paper that's blank and they put it over their paper. And then the student traces the words of their teacher learning how to write. That's the image of the example that's given to us. God has written a story for our lives. And yes, at times the story's difficult to follow. Yes, at times it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. Your hand didn't want to go that way. It's still learning. You, you still haven't twisted that way. And, and you're having trouble with the, 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 the intricate parts of it. But when you finish and you look and see what God has written out for your life, it's a beautiful picture. And yes, it may have been tough. Yes, it may have been painful. But God says it is well worth the journey because it leads to glory. Are you listening today? <laughs> Patterns for life. First one we saw was love. Second one we saw was suffering. And third one we see, overwhelmingly, once again, in the life of Jesus, is service. Service. Patterns for life. Service. Jesus was a servant while he was here on the earth. But can I tell you something? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what that means? Jesus is still a servant today, right now. The Bible says he's a minister of the sanctuary. You know what a minister is? Is a servant. Any ministry is just service. And therefore, Jesus is a minister presently. When Jesus broke from the side of God and robed himself in flesh, he became then and forever a servant. And when Jesus put down his life here on the earth, took it back up and was raised again and sat down at the right hand of God, yes, he finished the work of redemption, but he never finished the work of intercession and service for the saints. Church, we should never get so haughty or so proud to say, oh, I've done that. I helped out. I volunteered. I gave. I did it. Been there. Done that. I've been around the block. Gone to the prom. See, that's not what God is looking at. God says, I want you to give and give, and give, and give, and give, and serve, and serve, and serve, and serve. You say, but what if I run out of resources? What if I run out of energy? What if I run out of strength? God is the one who gives all those things. Those are all replenishable resources. And really, you are not meant to be a cistern. You know what a cistern is? It's a big you know, thing that's supposed to carry water. No, you are meant to be a funnel. Open up to God on the top and pouring into the world on the bottom. See, that's, God wants to get it to you, but he wants to get it through you. Are you listening today? Let's take a look at the example Jesus set for us back to John chapter 13. John chapter number 13. You'll remember Jesus just washed his disciples' feet. And then he starts to take a teachable moment with his disciples. And he says, I want you to take a look at what I've done. John chapter 13, we're going to read verse number 14 through verse number 17. John chapter 13, verse number 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says these words. He says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, before you start getting concerned that you're going to have to wash the person's feet next to you, I want you to read the next verse. Look what he says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In other words, he's saying, I don't want you to set this up as a tenant of the church that, you know, every third Sunday of the month, we all bring in the basins and start washing each other's feet. He says, no, this is just an example of service. Let's read on. Verse number 16. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, 
nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Now look at verse 17. If you know these things, now church, let me warn you. You now know these things. You have been taught. But look at what Jesus promises. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So you're not blessed if you don't do it. You say, well, how come I'm not blessed? Well, are you serving? Are you giving? Are you loving? Are you suffering through it? Are you, are you holding on? Are you doing what God has called you to do? See, if you're not, there's no blessing in that. God said, you're not doing it. I can't bless you. But the moment you step out in faith and say, you know what? I'm going to give. I'm going to love. I'm going to serve. I'm going to suffer through this. I, I will bear the reproach of his name. I will give until I can't give anymore. I will go until I don't have breath in my lungs. I will do until God says, stop. See, that moment God says, well, there you go. I've got to bless them. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. He won't deny the word of God. Let me close with this today. At the end of your life, you're not going to be asked how much money you have. God's not checking the bank account, not looking at your checkbook when you get to heaven. doesn't matter. God's not going to look at your degrees, your education. He doesn't care about your little business card. None of that stuff is important to God. God's not looking at how much stuff you amassed here on the earth. God's going to take a look at the tabernacle of your life, which houses the presence of God, and see how closely it fits to the pattern shown on the mountain. That's what's important in our life. Did you guys get something from the word of the Lord today? Come on, let's give God a great big praise. God is so good to us. Hey, you guys have been wonderful. I want to thank you guys for staying. You guys were great. It would be a tragedy if we had such a great time in the house of God. A tragedy if we came into the presence of the Lord, sang his praises, worshipped him, knelt at the altar and brought our cares. Some of you guys got healed today. I really do believe that. It would be a tragedy if we came together and heard the word of the Lord like we did laugh together, and then you walked out of this place. Your heart wasn't right with God. You died and went to hell. I don't want that. You don't want that. But most of all, God doesn't want that. Now, a lot of times people hear that term hell, and they say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. I, I don't think that a loving God would condemn people to hell. Well, first of all, we're already condemned because the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we choose with our life while we're here on earth whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. God left that free will choice to us. So God's not mean-spirited sending some people to hell and taking some people to heaven. It's not God. God is not cruel. God is love like we talked about. But God is so loving that he allows us the choice whether or not we'll receive his love and his free gift that takes us out of that destination of hell and gets us on track with heaven. God went to the cross because of love. Jesus was beaten and bloody and crucified because of love. And yet, is God unloving when his justice comes forth and the wrath of God that rests on us is carried out? No, it's still loving. And yet we don't understand that. And so we think that, you know, hell's not real. But you know the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about it. It's a very real place. Just by denying its existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to face the reality of it. And listen. You don't have to go there. You can choose with your life, here and now, where you go, whether heaven or hell. Sometimes people think, well, you know, all roads lead to heaven, Pastor. You know, you just stick to your truth. I got my truth. The longer we're true to ourselves, we'll get there. But that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. No, they don't. You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You're never going to make it to the moon. In the same way, you can't just do whatever you want to do or I want to do or some well-meaning church committee says to do and make it to heaven. There's one way, and that's God's way. And Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out in his son Jesus, don't you think that he would tell us how to get there? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because, you know, I I've been a really good person. I know God lets good people into heaven. But the problem with that statement is, you know that nowhere in the Bible say that good people go to heaven? That your goodness is what gets you into heaven? Or that you can be good enough to make it into heaven. You know why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to make it to heaven by being good. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Had me baptized or Christian as a child. Took me to religious classes. Maybe Sunday school or Sabbath school, catechism class. Hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. 
You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere does it say you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, go to religious classes or be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. Check it out. It's not there. Nowhere. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. It simply does not work that way. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I get that. I understand that. But, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. And I believe that I'm a Christian. Now, that's great. I'm glad you're here today. But could you just show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Because it's not there. That's like me saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, wear a Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and mock me up. Why? Because I'm not a part of the Dodgers organization. Never have been. Never will be. Therefore, you can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, I understand that, Pastor, but my last church I got involved. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, sang in the choir for a number of years, taught in the Bible class, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did that. But can you show that to me in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your church involvement gets you into heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It doesn't work like that. Now, sometimes people say, ah, ah, got you on this one. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm Christian, I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. I know about Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I can quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Now, while it's great and I'm glad you did those things, could you, could you just show that to me in the Bible? In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds. He was raised up in his church, got involved, became one of the leaders there. In fact, he could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He could debate the scripture. He gave his money. And when people looked to him, they looked to him to find out about God. We would have thought if anybody was going to heaven, it would have been this man by the name of Nicodemus. And yet when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I, I know, I know, our society, movies, television, Hollywood, the internet, books, all that kind of stuff, magazines, have made a mockery out of that term, being born again. But this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. We prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. And I need you to listen up right now because your eternal destiny is at stake. Don't let anything distract you. This is just you and God right now. Listen up. No one get up. No one leave. I want you to think about what God is speaking to your heart right now. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I want you to examine yourself. Do I need to do this? If the answer is yes, if the answer is Maybe, I hope so, I think so, then you need to do this. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear that sound, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up, I'll count it, you can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, time out, pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might be. 
Let's push past that today because the devil thinks you're dumb enough to pass this up. He's trying to push you into hell. And yet, I'm in your face talking to you about your eternal life, trying to get you into heaven. And so today, come on, a moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? No way. And yet, you're going to feel that pressure on your life. Let's push past that. Give God all of your heart and all of your life. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Now in a moment, who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus? Come on, you can give them all of your heart and all of your life today. Finally, who should raise their hand? You're lukewarm in this place. You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Lukewarm Christians are not real Christians because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly church service. Count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world, you can raise your hand. God sees and God knows. Okay, and then we'll give you some instructions right afterwards. We count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Who else today? Eight. Thank you. Nine. God bless you. Up top, there's ten. Thank you. Got you up there. Ten wise people already. Where are you at? If I didn't already see your ten. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve up there. Thank you. God bless you. Got you over there. Thank you, number twelve. On this side, who didn't I already see? There's one up there. Twelve. Thirteen. Thank you. On this side, fourteen. Got you right there. Fifteen. Thank you. Sixteen right there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Saying I need to give God all my heart. Seventeen. Got you up there. Thank you. Seventeen and eighteen up there. God bless you. Thank you. Who else today? There's 18 wise people. Where are you at? Number 19. Number 19, you're sitting there. All right. Got you up there, 19. Thank you. God bless you. 19 and 20. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else real quick? I didn't embarrass them. And I won't embarrass you. If that's you, just right, raise your hand up right now. Anybody else? There's 20 wise people already. Anybody else up there? Got you. Thank you. Who else today? 20, 21. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else? Anybody else? 22. God bless you. Snuck right in there in the end. Anybody else real quick? All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 22, 23. Hey, all right. Good choice. Now, I'm going to ask everybody that raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late, okay? You're saying, man, I should have done that or, or yeah, here I am. Hey, cool. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout, sing a song. As we do that, once you get a hold of your stuff, your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle, meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. Now, no one leave during this time. It's not the cue to go that way because the people that have just given their heart and life to the Lord, they're going to follow you that way. Okay? You don't want that on your head. You want them to come this way so that their heart and life can be changed. So let's do this. Let's all stand. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet us up front. You come right now. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. family rooms. You want to bring your children? They're welcome to come. You come right now. Make your way to the front. From the foyer, if you need to come in, come on in. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. guys good choice thank god you guys came so happy for you this is the best decision of your entire life and we're excited for you right over here to my right your left this is pastor joel right over there pastor joel is a really good guy nothing weird is going to go on you know sometimes you go to church you wonder are they weird listen you already got past me i'm about as weird as you're going to encounter today okay he's cool all right he's going to do three things i'm going to let you know what they are in advance so that you're not wondering or worried or any of that kind of stuff okay he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite jesus into your heart you're going to be born again, headed for heaven, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free literature, some little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading. It's free. Take about 20, 30 minutes if you read slow, okay? And it'll just help you to get your bearings. What do I do now that I'm a Christian? 
That literature will help you to find that out. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Let me break it down to you like this. It's a friend in church. Come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week, that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it, okay? He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.